Ah, my daily horoscope. You will have your intro interrupted by your opening credits. Hmm. Oh, hi! You caught me. Welcome to Comic Tropes, I'm your host Chris. Well, the latest news implies that Spider-Man will no longer be in the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. Apparently Disney and Sony are not cooperating. Uh, Sony has the movie rights to Spider-Man, and it seems we won't get to see him interacting with other superheroes again, and honestly, that's a shame. Uh, not that I have a favorite between two giant corporations, it's more just that I've enjoyed getting something a little bit new, seeing Spider-Man interact with other Marvel superheroes. It got me thinking. There are plenty of instances where Marvel has allowed an outside partner to utilize Spider-Man, and most of the time, they actually don't do a great job. But the specific example that I want to talk about today is this. This is known as a big little book. These were published by Whitman Publishing uh, for decades, and I don't know what to say about them other than they're kind of weird. Like, they're thick, and they would have always an illustration on one page and text on the other. Not a lot of text, obviously. So mostly it was still a picture book. You just had a little bit more of a story. But this was not written by Marvel writers. And there was only one Spider-Man ever made for, through um, Whitman Publishing, and this thing is just bonkers. It's one of the worst Spider-Man stories I've ever come across. I thought, let's just have some fun this week. Let me read to you, just through the pictures alone, the story of Spider-Man zaps Mr. Zodiac. Yeah, you've never heard of Mr. Zodiac before. He only makes an appearance here, and I think he is the lamest Spider-Man villain. That's including guys like Kangaroo. So, you know, that's saying something. Let's get into it. The story starts with Peter Parker, the civilian identity of Spider-Man, getting yelled at by his boss at the newspaper Daily Bugle. J. Jonah Jameson is saying, What's the matter with you? That's a pleasant entry to any story. And in the next page, Jameson keeps yelling at Peter Parker, saying, Then find out! He's assigning him a story to find out why there's a supervillain destroying the city. It's as vague as that. Before Peter can even get to work, a new employee comes in. This is Jane Virgo, and we can tell she's a new employee because it says, Jane Virgo, new employee. Yes, there's a new supervillain destroying the city, and we're instantly introduced to Jane Virgo. She's wearing a medallion that has all the uh, various zodiac signs. Try not to get too far ahead. I, I, you know, do you have questions about who this person is? Uh, you know, I'm sure she's on the up and up. I'm sure she's fine. Uh, I thought it would be fun to drink a liquor that relates to each of the zodiac signs. Now, I'm not an expert, so I've referred to outside uh, sources here, but I'm told that Virgos are independent. Uh, they like pure things. They're very bold. Uh, I think that a good fit for that is single malt scotch. Let's take a quick drink of this, and I'm going to get myself in a Virgo state of mind. Yeah, that's 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 definitely like bold. That's strong. It's a it's a single malt, so I think it's kind of pure. I get it. I get it. I'm in the Jane Virgo headspace. Let's continue. Editor and publisher J. Jonah Jameson leaps in and says, Your office is over there! So that's a nice friendly introduction to a new employee. And then apparently Jameson starts spying on Peter Parker for no explicable reason. And uh, Jane Virgo instantly starts hitting on Peter saying, When's your birthday? Next, Betty Brandt, J. Jonah Jameson's secretary, just walks up, taps her on the shoulder and says, I don't believe in astrology. I don't think the Daily Bugle is looking like a very friendly place to work. Imagine your first day on the job and your boss is just like, your desk is over there. And then just some other coworker walks up to tell you that they don't believe in what you believe in. Jane Virgo was hired to write a horoscope section for the Daily Bugle. It's a very common thing in a newspaper and some secretary is going to be like, I don't believe in that. 
Nice to meet you too. Peter is a little friendlier and he takes Jane out for pizza. And these pizza slices are absolutely gigantic. They are the size of their torsos. That is a lot of pizza. I mean, look at that chef in the background spinning the dough. That is massive. That said, this is a pretty lame pizza place. Its uh, name is just pizza. You can just see that on the window. It just says pizza and it's not even lined up right. Before I go too far, just note, the artwork is not good. I cannot find who the artist was that did this. I've tried to look for identifying signature things in their style. I can't identify it. I can't find any reference to a credited artist. I think that the artist was ashamed of this. Jane discusses astrology with Peter. He does not seem very interested. He is staring right through her, just clutching that napkin to his mouth. He is ready to mop up and just leave. He is not interested in this. Jane Virgo and Peter Parker decide to walk back to work. We can tell that because it says walking back to work. In the comics, Spider-Man works in Manhattan. There are no identifying buildings or streets, anything like that that would indicate exactly which city this takes place in. Entering the building. And the Daily Bugle has just written its name apparently in something like crayon. They, they couldn't splurge for a nice logo or anything like that. This poor artist. He had to do an illustration every three paragraphs. Some of these pages have nothing interesting going on. The employees get back from lunch and they're already getting yelled at by their boss. Lovely. And then we're told that Betty Brant also scolds Peter, so that's fun. Everyone treats Peter Parker like crap. He now turns to Jane Virgo and says, do you want to talk some more about crime fighting? And she just goes, not now. I also like how the artist has given Peter Parker the weirdest hairstyle ever. I don't know whether that's Dracula or Elvis or what, but that does not look normal. Jane Virgo goes straight to her garage and meditates over a zodiac symbol and she begins to change. We're told it's a weird change and I agree. She becomes an enormous mountain goat. That can happen. And now we get into the origin of Jane, aka Astro. We are told that Astro is a young boy from the Middle East 4,000 years ago and he was studying astrology He's in the Persian Gulf region, we're told, and a volcano erupts. I didn't think that there were that many active volcanoes there 4,000 years ago, but I'm not an expert. Maybe. He runs, this kid named Astro, and he falls into a cave. While he's there, he goes unconscious and he starts thinking about astrology signs. So when he emerges, 4,000 years later, he now has the power to transform into any of the zodiac signs. It's a good thing he wasn't thinking about his lunch. Specifically, the story says, For 4,000 years, Astro remained alive in that dark hole by lying very still, cleverly recycling the oxygen trapped with him. Yeah, a few things here. First of all, Astro, not a very good name for somebody that was living 4,000 years ago in presumably some sort of Mesopotamian culture near Babylon. I don't know. Just Astro, not the most realistic name. Second, you can't just lie still and recycle the same air. Uh, you die. You do not live for 4,000 years. But I think you guys all know that one. Finally, yes, it is true that Mesopotamian culture uh, first came up with zodiac symbols, but they only created about eight, and they were all based on the stars. It was later Greek culture, like from this point, thousands of years later, Greek culture, that came up with the animals like the ram, the cancer, uh, crab, uh, the, for the Pisces, the fish. They created all those symbols. So this guy was thinking about stuff that hadn't really been invented for a couple thousand years. Oh, I guess this story ain't the most accurate to real life. So in modern day, the volcano erupted again. That opened the cave and the now adult Astro emerges. Somehow he's also grown a spandex bodysuit and he decides to call himself Mr. Zodiac. He can now transform into any of the 12 symbols from the Zodiac calendar. And if he doesn't transform at least once a day, he'll turn into dust. So he's mad about this and he starts destroying various cities. We're told he has evil plans. 
it's not the deepest character motivation. We're not dealing with your Green Goblins, your Magnetos, your Doctor Dooms. This is Mr. Zodiac. He's just mad at the world. Okay. Last time we saw Peter Parker, everyone was treating him like crap. Now we're told that he's stripping for action. And he looks really angry about it. I don't know what has motivated him all of a sudden to put on his Spider-Man gear, but there he is, the amazing Spider-Man. And he instantly bumps into a rampaging mountain goat. The goat represents the Capricorn, which apparently is a larger-than-life fun personality. It's ambitious. I'm going to just have something fun for that. We've got apple schnapps. So usually you'd probably mix this with something, but I just like to drink it plain. Ooh, it's, uh, okay. This is 50% alcohol by volume. I wish I'd looked at that first. That was really strong, but it was, it was tasty, but wow. Oh, hopefully it's a while before Jane Virgo transforms again. Wow. Spider-Man runs up to the goat and apparently just sort of dumps glue out of his hands. That's not exactly his usual webbing. He just dumps a bunch of glue on top of the goat, but the goat just runs away and it says, in hot pursuit. Yeah, you might want to try actually using your webs or your jumping abilities there, Spider-Man. Spider-Man is completely unable to catch a goat all he has to show for his efforts are a torn right shoulder on his costume and some very nice graffiti on top of a building. It says compliments of Mr. Zodiac. And this artist cannot even get a simple two-point perspective right. Look at how these buildings are all going up at different angles. The next day at work, Jane Virgo walks up to Peter and says, Why so glum? And Peter isn't exactly hiding his emotions. Jane says, Take me to lunch! That's her way of cheering somebody up. They go right back for more gigantic pizza. And she isn't too subtle about this. She goes, know anything about Spider-Man? We're told there's a surprising realization. That realization is simply that Peter is telling Jane all about who Spider-Man is, because Jane has never heard of this amazing superhero before. Then Jane makes things awkward by just smiling evilly, and we're told she's deep in thought which is interrupted by the Italian chef who likes to drop off yet another piece of pizza. I'm starting to wonder if seeing pizza constantly is really just more of a thing that the writer was enjoying. He's like, boy, I sure could go for another delicious slice of pizza. Later that night, Spider-Man leaps into action, swinging into action, we're told, which is accurate because right above, we can see Spider-Man swinging into action. These captions are not helpful at all, but they do sort of remind me of the Stan Lee method of writing, where you would actually see Spider-Man swinging through a window, and J. Jonah Jameson might be thinking, Spider-Man swinging through that window! Meanwhile, a caption says, Spider-Man elegantly swings through a window into the Daily Bugle. Spider-Man first decides to check on the stadium, which is completely empty. And if it didn't say checking the stadium, this time I actually would not know what he's at. It looks like some sort of a weird frisbee that's going by him, but no, apparently that's a stadium. Then Spider-Man decides to jump into the harbor, which is just filthy. And he instantly bumps into a giant shark, but fortunately he's put his webs all the way around his head, so that means he can breathe underwater somehow. That shark represents Pisces, which is a fish symbol, and apparently Pisces are kind of introverted, they're a little weird, and uh, I just thought that being sort of water-based, I was just going to go with this nice blue drink, which is gin, it's my favorite. Uh, I'm basically just looking for an excuse to have some gin. Yes, very shark-flavored. This shark is evil and it bites a boat just to prove how evil it is. And you can really tell how evil it is if you look closely at its eye. It has like an angry eyebrow or something on it. So we know that this shark is evil. The shark attacks Spider-Man who has decided to stay underwater for reasons. And he shoves his web fluid in its mouth. We're told that it is a gooey mouthful. Okay then. The shark's mouth is glued shut. Unable to bite him, he tries to swim away, and Spider-Man swims after the shark, but believe it or not, the shark is able to swim faster than Spider-Man. The next morning, Peter Parker wakes up, and we're told that it is a disgusted Peter Parker, 
He's disgusted that he couldn't catch that shark. He might also be disgusted that he apparently sleeps in a room with a stove right behind him. He gets to work and he still can't control his anger. He's punching his hand, but to be fair, he may be angry at something else. Apparently, Peter is wearing the same clothes every single day. He might just be angry at his financial situation. Peter's boss shoves him physically, along with some papers saying, I want to talk to you. And apparently he then blows smoke rings in Peter's face. He's upset because Peter hasn't gotten any photos of Mr. Zodiac yet. If your boss shoves you and blows smoke right in your face there in the office, you may actually have grounds for a hostile work environment. Just a friendly tip from me to you. Jane Virgo goes to comfort Peter after seeing him abused by his boss. And then we're told that she feels her teeth. Get it? She was the shark all along. And they're back to eating pizza. Spider-Man checks on his costume, which apparently he put in the oven to dry off. I just would have hung it in the shower, but whatever, it seems to have worked for him because in the next page, we're told that he's peering over the city. You know, one of those cities full of generic buildings and a bunch of hash marks. What a detailed city. We're told Spidey continues his search. I have no idea where he'd even begin to look for something in a city as massive as New York, but apparently he lucks out because in the next panel, we're told that there is a flood right beneath him. And that flood is caused by a huge Greek guy just pouring water out of a bucket. It's Aquarius. An Aquarius is often a trendsetter, somebody that's cool and sets the tone for everybody else. Uh, one of the current trends is the popularity of Fernet Branca, a very unique um, Italian liqueur. I'm going to try it out. I've never had this before, so I don't know what to expect. <laughs> it's, it's not that good. I don't know how to describe that. It tastes like a bunch of flowers mixed with dirt, and it's got a potent aftertaste. That is not pleasant at all. But... That's why I'm not an Aquarius. Aquarius douses Spider-Man in water. We're told that Spidey gets a shower. I guess that's one way to stay clean. And then Aquarius walks away and Peter can't catch up to him. At the office, we're told that Peter tips a cup of water and spills it on his shirt and Jane Virgo teases him about it. And you can see on Peter's face, he's pretty upset. Jane asks if they can have another rap session. No, this isn't a case of Jane Virgo predicting a Post Malone rap song about Spider-Man over 40 years before it came out. She means rap like talk, presumably over more pizza. Peter seems really into it as he just sort of walks away from her, flipping up his hand and saying, it's a date. Peter decides to get to the restaurant this time by driving in his car. First of all, that looks like no car I'm familiar with, and I think I know a thing or two about cars. I sell them. But on top of that, Peter has never had the funds to own a car, and living in Queens and working in Manhattan, he has no need for a car. If he really needs to get far, he's Spider-Man. He doesn't have the money to get a car. But in this story, he's got a car. It really is not essential at all to the plot, although there will be a car chase later, so don't give up on this video now. Stay tuned. You've got a car chase coming up. Jane Virgo is shown staring at herself in the mirror closely, and that's because she's about to transform, so she's really worried about being able to get this date over with in time. After work, but before the date, Peter decides to visit his Aunt May. We're told that it is a pleasant surprise, and this is back when they were drawing Aunt May like she was some sort of living dead zombie or a mummy with glasses and a shirt. She looks like death warmed over. Aunt May sits down to knit. Peter stands over her. He still hasn't removed that camera. He wears that thing everywhere. And he asks her about a third grader named Ben that apparently Aunt May babysits. She says that he hasn't finished his vegetables, so Peter decides to talk to him and she goes, don't be too firm and just look at that. Like if you saw that looking at you, you'd say, oh, that's a zombie. That looks like something out of the movie Life Force or maybe Return of the Living Dead. Aunt May is absolutely terrifying. No wonder Ben isn't in the same room. He's probably hiding from her. Apparently he's watching TV. See, the caption says so. 
Peter tells Ben to eat his vegetables, then says that he's got a date with the girl next door, and then Ben just blurts out, Spider-Man wouldn't date girls. What would give him that idea? Honestly, all I can figure is maybe this is something the writer felt. That just seems out of left field, especially for a story that came out in 1976. Spider-Man wouldn't date girls. Okay, maybe he wouldn't. At the restaurant, Jane Virgo is wearing sunglasses, which Peter thinks is strange. Then she hides her face behind a menu. Hey, that's not awkward, right? If you went to a date and all of a sudden she just sort of uh, was like, yeah, let's talk. Then Jane just leaves. But the waiter still wants Peter to order something. And by the way, Peter is wearing his camera at the dinner table. But he skips out on the bill by jumping out of a window in his Spider-Man costume. Our hero, everyone. He decides to continue his search for Mr. Zodiac. Then he just stands around wondering what to do. Maybe he should have thought of that before he started swinging around. Fortunately, he doesn't have to solve anything because a gigantic ram runs at him. The ram represents the sign Aries, and Aries are known for being tenacious, candid, uh, they don't put up with anything. I think that like a, uh, a bourbon is a good drink for matching with that sign. So let's try some of this Jim Beam. Oh, not my favorite, not my favorite. Wow. Spider-Man finally uses his web slinging abilities. He tags one of the horns on the ram, but it just pops off. And then he stands there, just looking at it, instead of chasing after the ram. The next day, he drives to work, and by the way, his license plate has changed since the last time we saw it. At work the next day, Jane acts irritated, and she has a band-aid on her forehead. That's because she lost a horn. But all of that is interrupted when J. Jonah Jameson gets right in Peter's face and says, You're lazy! But Peter bounces back with his fists raised at his boss, saying, that's enough! Here's a headline for the Daily Bugle. Daily Bugle, most hostile workplace ever. Jane tries to calm Peter down, don't know why, but they start talking, she just stares at him, and then she says that she's got a headache and has to leave. Before she can, she starts fidgeting, Peter's still right there, and he explains what's been going on, and he says that he basically thinks he knows, he's figured out what's going on. Peter puts his finger right in her face and says, I know who you are. She says no one will believe it, but Peter says Jameson will believe it. Why? Jameson interrupts their argument, but then Peter stands up for himself, clenching his fists because anything goes in this work environment. But that gives Jane the time to slowly walk away. Peter has the time to just sort of raise his hand going, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jane gets in the elevator, but Peter decides to take the stairway. With his spider powers, he can take the stairway very quickly, but not as quickly as the elevator. And Jane Virgo, a.k.a. Mr. Zodiac, drives off in a sports car. Peter decides to chase after Mr. Zodiac in his crappy car instead of changing into Spider-Man. For some reason, Jane Virgo goes straight to Aunt May's house. I don't know how she knows about that, but she does. Then Ben jumps out of the door and says, Aunt May is sick. So Mr. Zodiac kidnaps Ben, and there's Aunt May in the background. Look at her. She looks like a skeleton this time. Just terrifying. Now Peter decides that instead of trying to rescue the kidnapped child, he'll give his Aunt May some medicine, although this awkward drawing by the artist looks more like he's shoving a bottle of ketchup into a mummy's corpse. When Peter runs outside, Jane Virgo is transforming, and she turns into what the book calls Two huge identical kung fu wrestlers. Kung fu wrestlers. I don't know what that is. Yes, there we see those kung fu wrestlers. We're told that it's a twin menace, but Spider-Man delivers a powerful karate chop. Not really one of the moves he's known for. That takes out one of the twins. The other one runs away with Ben. Yeah, those weird twins represent Gemini, which uh, that sign apparently is known for having internal conflicts, for not always knowing who they are, and uh, for just sort of getting crazy and being out of control. I think tequila represents that, so let's take tequila. I like tequila, but boy, these transformations are coming fast now. 
Ooh, it's good. Spider-Man chases after them, but now Mr. Zodiac turns into a lion. The lion represents the Leo, known for wanting attention and for having a fierce personality. That's me, by the way, Leo. Let's try some Fireball Cinnamon Whiskey to represent that. Boy, these are just coming one right after the other. <laughs> that is totally different from tequila. In the next page, Mr. Zodiac is now a bull. And I don't know why Ben at this point doesn't just jump off, because it's really up to him to ride this bull. The bull represents the Taurus, a stubborn, aggressive, bull-headed. I think that, uh, let's see, vodka. Vodka totally represents uh, the, the Taurus. Here we go. Oh, oh, I wish he'd stop transforming. This is getting intense. Spider-Man notes that Mr. Zodiac is probably getting tired of the transformations, but in the next page, he is now transformed into scales, which are flying. I don't know why scales would fly, but whatever. Uh, ben still isn't jumping off. At this point, there is nothing holding him. He's just basically holding on to scales as they fly through the air. This book is intent on getting me drunk. The Libra is uh, represented by the scales. Libras are into the arts and they're very passionate. They're into uh, music and stuff like that. They're, they're just into, uh, yeah, the arts. I'm not gonna be as clear and coherent as I was 10 minutes ago, but I think that absinthe represents their sort of uh, emotional personality. Absinthe uh, is, is dreamy. It makes you sort of see things, so. Here we go. Oh, I like the licorice taste of absinthe, but it is strong stuff. I feel like my tongue is on fire. The scales fly past the airport, which does seem dangerous, but unfortunately we get no drama with airplanes being in danger. And Spider-Man is just running after them. It's not very dramatic. And now Mr. Zodiac transforms into a gigantic archer. I'm sure you wanted to see Spider-Man and Hawkeye fight in that Civil War movie, but they didn't get to. But now we get to see what that might have been like as Spider-Man faces down an archer. The archer is Sagittarius, and they are bold. They're risk-takers. They are, uh, I think, friendly. I, I don't know. But anyway, I'm just going to uh, have some Mezcal. Uh, it's kind of like tequila. It's made from uh, Mezcal plants. I don't know. Oh my god, this is too much. The transformations have to stop soon. Wow. Spider-Man uses his webbing to make a trampoline and jumps up on top of the archer. Uh, then he jumps right over him. He doesn't connect at all. For some reason that makes the archer crouch down and while he's doing that, Ben, we're told, slides out. Great, in this illustration he's only about five stories up. That, that sounds easy to get down. Ben falls asleep because he's been being carried by Mr. Zodiac for so long. He just falls right asleep. And finally, Mr. Zodiac transforms into what we're told is a hideous scorpion. Of course, Spider-Man has a terrific enemy named the Scorpion. I think he's kind of cooler than this giant scorpion, which has no good detail. It just looks like it's mechanical, but no, apparently it's just a giant scorpion. Whatever. Uh, anyway. The scorpion represents Scorpio, and they are um, uh, complex, they're vivacious. I mean, it starts to feel like all of these signs could apply to anyone. That, that's how much I uh, have faith in it, but whatever. Uh, they're fun-loving, and I'm going to have some fun-loving rum to go with that. Let's finish everything off with a bunch of rum. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Spider-Man picks up Ben to take him to safety, and the Scorpion gives chase. So Spider-Man says, I guess I blew it. No comment. Spider-Man snags the Scorpion with his webbing, which is really what he should have done all along. And he just sort of drags it down. He doesn't let it escape this time. And finally, Spider-Man just covers it up with tons and tons of webbing. He really should have done this to the goat. The goat would have been much easier to, than this gigantic... Uh, Scorpion. Spider-Man tells Ben to recite the multiplication tables to distract Mr. Zodiac. And for some reason that works. 
So Mr. Zodiac transforms back into Jane Virgo, totally captured by the webbing, and then she turns into dust as a train blows by. Ben and Spider-Man don't seem concerned at all that this person just died. Peter goes back to work and Jameson yells at him saying, where have you been? And then Peter just acts dumb. Not the most exciting ending, is it? The villain just sort of turns into dust and then we get two more pages of Peter Parker going back to work, getting yelled at by his boss, and just acting dumb like he doesn't know what's going on. That's not exactly the most exciting conclusion. So these books were hilarious. You know, they, they did them for everybody. They had a Batman one, Mickey Mouse, uh, Tom and Jerry, Woody Woodpecker, Bugs Bunny, all those sort of characters, probably stuff like Zorro. Basically, Whitman produced books based on any kind of uh, science fiction or fantasy character or cartoons. So they made lots and lots of these. These were very popular throughout the, um, basically, I think the 50s through the 80s, basically, the, these were selling really well. Um, this one was from 1976. 1976, this guy came out. Uh, there's a lot more. They're all kind of like this, where it's about the character, but it isn't quite right. It's like you don't get what you normally count on. Like, I'd say that in a normal Spider-Man story, you can count on getting things like a soap opera drama that's a little more complex than going out for pizzas three times. Uh, and you would get, you know, like, love triangles. And then, of course, you'd get lots of big, bombastic action. Now, this villain turns into, like, about 11 of the 12 uh, uh, Zodiac signs but it's not that exciting. Anyway, what is exciting? Fan art, and we've got some today, so let's take a quick look at what came in this week. Shane Evans sent in this piece of artwork where I am a robot, not unlike my sidekick, Infotron. You can see more of Shane's work on DeviantArt and Instagram. Vibhav Kumar sends in this piece all the way from India, you can see more of his artwork on Instagram, and he says that some of his heroes include Jim Lee and Scott Williams, so he's drawing a little bit in their style. I love it. It looks fantastic. Finally, Ryan Devine created some brilliant artwork, which feature me as Miracle Man, and you can see that I'm saying my magic words, which are, of course, comic tropes backwards. Fantastic stuff. If you would like to have artwork featured on this channel, as long as it has something to do with comic tropes, just send it to this address, comictropes at gmail.com. I'm happy to feature it. Then I will pick a winner that gets a Gachapon prize out of the Gachapon machine, which was donated by Lunar Shine Store. So I've got a bunch of balls in here that all end in one, two, or three. Let's see who wins. Rolling it around. All right. We... This week have number, it's 41. So basically the last number there, one. Number one is the winner, that is Shane. Shane Evans, you have won a Gachapon prize. Let's take a quick look at what you won this week. And uh, thank you so much for watching the show. If you want to support the show, just remember to hit like or subscribe. I have a Patreon if you want to support it on an ongoing basis. I have coffee if you want to do a one-time tip. There's also merchandise. I have official Comic Tropes t-shirts. Uh, available. All of those are listed uh, on YouTube underneath this video, so be, feel free to uh, take a look at that. All right, looks like this is, I believe this is Cronin. Uh, these are all Hellboy Gachapons for now until I get back to uh, Tokyo to get some more Gachapons. So this is Cronin from Hellboy. Very cool, Shane. I'll get your information. I'll send that your way. Thank you everyone for watching. I've got some really, really cool stuff coming up. Just wanted to do a silly one. I needed sort of a light week. I hope you enjoyed it, but until next time, keep reading comics.